Okay, welcome everyone. I have uh, 3 p.m. so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, you are here for season extension uh, with Heather Stoven and Nicole Sanchez, part of our Growing Oregon Gardeners Level Up series. Um, my name is Erica Sontag, Sontag and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Um, I'm the Master Gardener Program Coordinator in Jackson County, and I'd like to start with a brief land acknowledgement. Uh, Jackson County was traditionally located within the um, homelands of the Tecalma people, and Tecalma means those along the river. Um, so these people lived along the Rogue River. They were forcibly removed to the central Oregon coast and the Willamette Valley between 1852 and 1856. And today the Confederated Tribes of Grand Round Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians identified their members as living descendants of the Tecalma. So thank you for coming today to this Growing Oregon Gardeners Level Up session. This series is produced by the Oregon State University Extension Master Gardener Program and has been organized and led by a group of Master Gardener coordinators, OSU faculty and staff from across the state. The OSU Extension Master Gardener Program educates Oregonians about the art and science of growing and caring for plants. We are in 27 counties across the state and train thousands of Master Gardener volunteers. OSU Extension Master Gardeners are volunteer educators, neighbors, and on the ground researchers who serve their community with solid training in science-based sustainable gardening and a love of lifelong learning. If you're a Master Gardener volunteer, thank you for dedicating your time and knowledge. If you're not a Master Gardener, but are interested in becoming one, we'll be hosting a training for new volunteers in 2022. You can learn more about the program and about other workshops in this series on our website. Today's workshop is being recorded and captioned and we have already started recording. Um, and the recording will be accessible to view along with the presentation slide deck and all of our other presentations in the series on the website. And we'll have a link for that in the chat. Um, so we do have closed captioning available and you are able to turn that off if you do not want to watch that during the presentation and you can find that button at the bottom of your screen. And then just some other brief housekeeping, um, due to the high amount of participants, we've turned off the chat for, today, for today's presentation, but we still want to hear your questions. And so if you would like to submit a question, you can use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and if there's a question that you like, you know, one that you might also have or be interested in hearing the answer to, you can use the upvote button feature and that will move the question to the top of the list and we'll see um, that that's a question that we should prioritize. And we'll do our absolute best to answer all of your questions today. Uh, there's a small group of us working behind the scenes to help do that and our speakers will be able to answer some questions as well. But if we don't get to your question today, we recommend reaching out to your local um, extension service agent um, to help you answer that. Um, and so I will go ahead and introduce our speakers now. Uh, we have both Nicole Sanchez and Heather Stoven from OSU Extension. Nicole is an assistant professor in horticulture and serves Harney, Klamath, and Lake Counties. Nicole coordinates the Master Gardener program and is part of the small farms team as well. Also known as the Klamath Basin, this region is home to the Klamath, Modoc, and Yahuskin tribes. These federated tribes are an integral part of the Klamath community, contributing over $25 million to the Klamath economy and employing over 250 people in the county. The Klamath tribes provide over 50 services and programs in Klamath County, including an extensive program to preserve tribal languages. Heather is an assistant professor of practice for small farms and community horticulture and serves Yamhill County, where she coordinates the Master Gardener program. Yamhill County is located within the traditional homelands of the Kalapuya. Following the Willamette Valley Treaty of 1855, the Kalapuya were forcibly removed to reservations in Western Oregon. Today, the living descendants are a part of the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde Community of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. So with that, I will hand it over to Heather and Nicole. Perfect, thank you, Erica. Um, I, that was a very nice welcome. I am going to um, share my screen here and get started. All right, so um, as that was a very nice introduction, Erica, I appreciate it. And I also wanted to say that my pronouns are she, her, and hers. 
So I'm going to start out um, by talking about season extension. And so just a little bit of an overview of what we're going to be going over today. I'm going to first talk about what season extension can do for you and the benefits of season extension. I'll move on then to talk about some crops that are um, best used with season extension, talk about some of the materials and techniques used for this practice. And then we're going to have a five minute question break in the middle. And then at that point, then I'm going to switch with Nicole and she's going to continue on and talk about planning for season extension, research projects that she's been involved in, and then talk about choosing varieties for season extension. So first, we are going to have a poll question. So I'm going to launch the poll. Hopefully, you all will be able to see this. So the question is, what is your top goal for using season extension? And so this is a single choice. So you can get an earlier harvest, harvest later into the fall, increase the amount of produce harvested, or add nutrition to your diet during the off season. So I still see some movement on this. So I'm gonna wait another 10 seconds here for you all to have a chance to enter. Okay, so now I'm going to end the poll. All right, so it looks like most of you would like to use season extension to be able to extend your harvest later into the fall. However, um, increasing the amount of produce harvested also is up there and adding nutrition to off seasons. So using it for an earlier harvest isn't quite as much of an interest yet, but perhaps after I talk a little bit more about it, then we'll. Um, you might decide that that might be an option for you as well. So um, some of the reasons that you may decide to use season extension is by um, applying some of these techniques, you can create a favorable microclimate around your plants. So you can make it so that your crops are protected from extreme temperatures, whether it be extreme heat or um, extreme cold as well. Um, so you can push your production time so that you're able to harvest a little bit earlier and then same thing, harvest a bit later in the season and lengthen the time that you can harvest in your garden. And so um, this reiterates a lot of what I just said. You can add nutrition during these off times. These are things that you can do with season extension. What you cannot do with season extension is change greatly your climate. So you're not going to, you know, all of a sudden start being able to grow tomatoes in February or do things that you know, are, are really um, outside of your climate conditions. The other thing that's important to note is that with season extension, you really can't leave these different, um, these different techniques, whether it be a low tunnel or a high tunnel, um, you can't leave these unattended. So these do require a little bit of work and it doesn't mean that you're always necessarily gonna be successful either. I mean. A lot of times, you know, this is definitely going to improve your gardening, but, you know, sometimes there just isn't much you can do if you have a historical cold temperature heat wave or something like that. Another thing that I want to point out is that this isn't necessarily going to be treated the same in every location. So Nicole and I are here today and we're both from different regions. I'm from Yamhill County, which is in the Willamette Valley. And Nicole is um, from South Central Oregon, or that's where she works at. And so they're very different climates. She has more of a high desert um, climate and I have more of a um, temperate climate. And so they're gonna require a little bit different um, techniques when doing season extension. So we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go through. All right, so certain things work well for season extension. And so cool season vegetables can um, be used to either start producing a little bit sooner with season extension or the same token, they can also be planted late summer, early fall, and then um, using season extension, you can harvest late, later into the seasons. And so some crops that you might consider for um, cool season vegetables might be lettuce or spinach, um, radishes, herbs. And again, this might vary based upon where you're located. 
So in the Willamette Valley, things like kale and collards are very, are very hardy, or just in general, they're very hardy. And so we don't ever get that cold. So we don't necessarily need to protect those as much with season extension. But if you're um, in a different climate, such as um, what Nicole has, then they may be better, be better candidates for season extension. So one thing that I'd like to point out is that you're going to be getting some resources in an email that's going to arrive tomorrow with some different publications. And in one of these is winter and um, fall, fall and winter vegetable gardening. And within this publication, there's a table which shows you the temperatures that um, your, these crops can handle, what low temperatures. And so this can be kind of useful for you as you're planning for season extension. You can look and say, okay, you know, if I were to plant in March, what are my average low temperatures? Is this likely to survive? Even if I have you know, a little bit of season extension and could give myself an extra couple of degrees. So those are some things to think about. So summer vegetables are also something that's often used for se season extension. And many of you expressed interest in being able to extend your um, fall harvest. And so of course, tomatoes and peppers are good candidates for that. And so being able to you know, keep your crops from you know, maybe getting nipped by that first fall frost can be of benefit. Um, also fruits can be used with season extension. So not, of course, not your fruit trees, that's not really gonna fit, but um, cane berries sometimes under high tunnels. Strawberries can be grown under low tunnels. So like your day neutral varieties, for example, they can produce um, you know, later into the season and having something like a low tunnel can help um, push that production later than you would normally see. So I'm gonna go through next and talk about some of the different techniques that you can use for season extension. And so they can go from the very simple, like choosing the right location, and then I'm gonna go in order of complexity. So starting with row covers and then finishing um, with high tunnels, but also note that you can combine some of these tactics. So I have here um, a picture of plastic mulch being used in a high tunnel. So there we're combining two different tactics. So kind of keep that in mind that that can be used. Oops. So the first one is row covers. And so row covers are a um, fabric and they can be spun or woven. And there's pictures of this here. So this is an example to a multiple techniques of this um, row cover being used in a high tunnel. But these are basically pretty easy to use. Um, they can be purchased from garden centers or online, and they can be used, like I said, in combination with other techniques, or they can just be used alone in the garden and just be placed over your crop. And some of you may have just placed a sheet over your crops before if you knew there's going to be a late frost or an early frost. Um, so this is kind of the same, the same concept, but these are products that you can purchase that are made specifically for um, protecting your crops. And so they're made of different weights. So the thinnest type of these fabrics are um, made more for insect management. And so they can be placed over the crop and keep things like cucumber beetles or, or different things out of your crops. And so these are a little bit more breathable because they're thinner. And then they go all the way up to different levels um, to where they can keep a crop up to eight degrees warmer underneath the blanket. Um, so one thing to note with the use of these is that you do not want them to be directly in contact with your crop that you'll be harvesting. So here we have a picture of some cabbage in the bottom right. And the good thing about these is the blanket, you know, is going to be kind of hitting some of these outer leaves and not as much as the crop or else you could always remove some of those outer leaves. But if the fabric is touching the actual crop or you're harvesting, they can freeze that. So kind of keep that in mind. And that can be one of the benefits of using a um, low tunnel, which we'll talk a little bit more about as we move on. And so these are temporary though. So these are gonna be placed on just for your um, cold event and then they'd be removed afterwards because otherwise, especially for the heavier blankets, they are going to be you know, removing a lot of the air movement and there's not a lot of light getting in there. So they're just temporary for when um, you have a major cold event coming. So the next um, topic that I'm gonna be talking about is plastic mulch. And so this is 
typically black plastic or black mulch, and sometimes it can come in other colors. Um, but the reason for the black mulch is that it can help um, warm the soil temperature. So you can see here with tomatoes, this is used quite commonly in the Willamette Valley. It's placed under the crop, there's a hole in there, and then the plant is planted into it. And that helps to keep the soil warm, which is good for these warm season crops that like tomatoes and peppers that, you know, the slow, the soil is going to be slower to warm in the spring. So this can help get a little head start on that production for those crops. It's also used um, commercially as well for tomato or for strawberries often. And the benefit to this is you're keeping the fruit off of the ground, which can help with some disease management, such as botrytis and that sort of thing. They're also beneficial because they can keep um, weeds from interfering with your crop as well. And notice how some of these, so you can purchase this. This one already has some holes made into it. You can kind of make your own as well, like you see here. And then some of them can come with irrigation underneath. And that can be beneficial because it's really, it can be hard to irrigate these plastic mulches. And so it's best to have some drip lines placed underneath and um, they can be either in single rows or double rows, as you see here. Often the um, double rows can be a little bit more effective, but it really depends on you know, where you're planting and the, the um, width of your row and that sort of thing. And so the plastic, like I said, can be good for keeping evaporation down. You're really keeping in that moisture that you're applying, but you really need to keep on top of it and check to make sure that you're watching for water issues because it's hard to see the drip line, of course, when it's underneath the plastic. So the next technique would be cloches. And so historically, this photo here of these glass bells or domes have been what have been traditionally used as a cloche. And you would just go and pick that up, put it over your crop, and you would be able to you know, protect your, your plants a little bit. There's, of course, more modern um, applications of this now. We have these type of product, which is just um, plastic that you'd have to put over your, over your plants. There's these type here that have um, water that fills this space. And so um, you know, this could be placed over a tomato plant, for example, in the spring and um, you know, help to provide a little bit of warmth um, especially if you get a few cold nights. The next step up are cold frames. And so a lot of times people will take old windows or that sort of thing and, and create to make their own cold frames. They can be kind of fun to see and good for garden re repurposing. And there's many different ways to do it. So you can see a few different examples here in these photos. And um, one thing with this, along with some of the other types of season extension that we've been talking about so far, is you can't necessarily leave them unattended. So you have here these structures, you can see they're not really very large. So you might use these in the spring, for example, as you're you know, trying to grow some new plant starts. You want to give them that early, you know, some extra warmth. But if you leave these covered all day long, then you know, it's gonna get really hot in there with that really small space. So keep that in mind that you, know, you don't want to cook your plants. And it says, you know, like I wrote here, you know, are you home? <laughs> you can't really leave the lid on and on a sunny day, you know, leave for the rest of the day, go to work and then expect that your plants are necessarily gonna be good all day if the sun comes out. So you know, keeping, keeping these managed can be you know, a little bit of time. Um, and then also consider wind direction. So as you can see these um, cold frames here with these lids that are kind of domed, you could see how the wind might catch that and um, cause the, the structure to be damaged. So keep the wind direction in mind as well when you're planning for these. So next is hotbeds. And a lot of times, the cold frames can be heated so that they provide a little bit of extra um, oomph, I guess, as you're starting your garden in the spring. And so traditionally, manure has been used to heat the soil. And that's a little, it's, there's definitely some preparation to this. And I did put um, a link to an extension publication in the resources that you're going to get 
about how to properly do this. But keep in mind that there can be food safety concerns. Um, I think especially in Western Oregon where we have so much water, you really need to be concerned about um, good drainage under this. You'd have to you know, dig, uh, dig a hole, you'd have to have your manure prepared and have it heating to the right level. Then you place soil over it and then you would plant your crop. And so that's how that's traditionally been done. However, you can also these days use something like a heat mat and put that under the space to heat it and then you don't have those food safety concerns. So again, this would be something that could be used in the spring as you have um, plant starts or something you wanna get started. Um, probably not gonna be as useful in the fall unless you're, you know, have something small because otherwise it's just not gonna necessarily fit in that small space. So another thing you may see occasionally is the use of things like milk jugs to apply heat in a cold frame. And so the premise behind this is that that water in those jugs are gonna hold some heat. So it's not going to get quite as cold in your cold frame or your space. And, you know, it may give you a little bit of assistance. Um, larger containers actually work better. I've definitely seen in high tunnels, like big 55 gallon drums full of water to help heat that space. And that's probably gonna be more effective than small milk jugs. And also these can become brittle in sunlight and break. But just so you know that that is what that is about if you see it and you can always try it and see what happens. So as I was going through this, I um, also was looking at the extension publication how to build a raised bed or cloche. So this is an OSU extension publication. These are some pictures from one of my master gardeners gardens who built one of these raised bed cloches. And it can be kind of confusing, I think, some of the distinctions between a cold frame versus a cloche. Technically cloches are supposed to be, um, you know, temporary or easily moved. And I guess you could argue, argue that these raised bed cloches, you can you know, take the plastic off or take the um, fabric off. And in that case, it can be kind of temporary, but obviously the whole structure in general isn't necessarily easily moved. So just so you know that there can be some terminology differences, but don't let it worry you. It's not, you know, you're not necessarily saying anything wrong or just kind of know that these are all structures that are used for season extension. Um, a hot bed versus a cold frame, I think, is more, um, more clear. As I had said, if a hot bed, you're going to be having heated soil. In a cold frame, you're just setting more on the soil. You're going to be using the soil right under the cold frame. So next is a low tunnel. And the benefit of these is that you don't have that um, fabric resting right on your plants. So this is Again, it's more of, it's a temporary structure, but at the same time, there's a little bit more that goes into um, preparing one of these. And you can use different types of materials on them. They're typically maybe two to three feet tall. It kind of depends on what kind of crop you're growing. And so here's a picture of some low tunnels and this actually has some shade cloth on it. So as I mentioned, it can be you can have fabric on these, you can have plastic on them, there can be shade cloth, but depending upon what you use, you may have to do a little bit more management. So if you use plastic on these, a lot of times uh, people will raise the sides so that um, during the day it's not getting as hot in there, or sometimes the plastic will have kind of holes in it to allow for ventilation. Um, fabric, the um, frost protection blankets could be used over them as well for a little bit. Um, the thing with those though, is you're not gonna be getting as much light in there. Um, but these again, do need to be managed just like some of the other structures we've talked about. And then also keep in mind that you're gonna have to remember that you know insects or weeds or that sort of slugs also would like to go in there. So it's not a put it on and forget about it. You need to check on your plants, make sure that they're okay. And then what I put on there last is, how is your back? Because not only building these, um, you can have metal hoops or you can use PVC. There's a whole bunch of different structures you can use, but it does take some management, potentially taking um, fabric on and off, opening the sides, that sort of thing. But they can be you know, relatively, in invest, relatively inexpensive as an investment 
and you can do it for you know definitely less than fifty dollars. Put one together. There's kits. You can build your own, and um, they can be really helpful for season extension. And here's a picture of uh, one with some burlap over it. Here's kind of a halfway between maybe a low tunnel and a high tunnel, which is my next topic here. So is kind of a nice segue. So the difference between a high tunnel and a greenhouse is that a high tunnel is going to be passively heated. It's not going to have a furnace in it or a heater. It's going to be a structure with typically plastic over it that's um, open-ended, although you can often you know, close doors or, or side vents. And so this is gonna be less expensive than a greenhouse because you're not heating it. Um, you also need to think about orientation with these. Um, a lot of times with greenhouse structures, it depends which parallel you're at, which um, if you're at the 40th or 45th parallel or above, they often recommend, or universities and researchers often recommend um, placing these on a north-south orientation to take advantage of winter light. But it kind of depends on your purpose for this. If you're not going to be using it in winter, then maybe that's less important to you. And maybe you want to think a little bit more about wind or some other aspects. So doing a little bit of research, um, potentially you know, contacting Extension if you have questions or looking at some of the different resources we're providing uh, would be helpful as you're planning for one of these structures. And then also keep in, want, in mind that wind can also become an issue. I've definitely seen wind gusts that have come through and ripped side vents or ripped plastic. So sometimes um, if these structures aren't being used in the winter, the plastic might just be taken off or the houses should be closed prior to a storm event. So again, not a leave it and forget it sort of endeavor. Because um, these, again, can, like I said, be an issue in storms as well as um, having a lot of heat retention during the day. Sometimes some of these can be really um, advanced and you can have fans in them or you can have um, sensors that control the um, side vents and that sort of thing so that they can open if it gets to be too, um, too heat or too hot in there. Um, and there's also some different things you can do with the type of plastic that is put over the top. So you can have shade that goes over. You can also have different thicknesses of plastic or different, um, different, I guess, tints of the plastic. So it could be more of a white versus a clear. So if it's gonna be whiter, then it's not gonna have as much sun coming through. So that might be better for the summertime to not have as much um, solar influence versus um, different times of year. In the winter, you might want to have a clear plastic so you can get as much sunlight through. And you can um, purchase tube vendors to um, help to build your own high tunnel if you would like to, and that helps with cost quite a bit. Another thing to think about with these structures is your climate. Um, in Nicole's climate, she was sharing with me, a lot of times growers or homeowners or, or gardeners will place um, grasses or different um, barriers along the side of the high tunnels so that wind isn't getting underneath and you're kind of protecting your crop a little bit more. So think about that as well with your specific climate. So other things to consider with high tunnels, again, with your climate is the actual shape of your structure. So you can have structures that are just, um, I guess, arched overall, so they can be shorter in height, and those are going to be warmer than something like this Gothic arch. And so the Gothic arch is really good for um, places where there's snow, so that, that's that pointed tip that you see there in this photo. And so that will help to you know, have the snow fall off of the sides, but even in big snow events, even here in the Willamette Valley, you have to go through and you know, sweep off the snow or go underneath and try and you know, bang it off because these structures can definitely collapse with a lot of weight. Sometimes um, a double layer of plastic can be useful. So 
instead of on the top just being one layer of plastic, there's two, and then there can be a fan in between there. And that fan will help um, either blow ambient air into that space to kind of help insulate the greenhouse or a little heater can be in there and that will help melt the snow so that can come off. Another consideration um, for retaining heat in a high tunnel is the twin wall in the thickness. So the twin wall is this, this type of material on the end wall and it's a polycarbonate panel. And so there can be um, different thicknesses in that that can help retain heat as well. And then again, like I said in the last slide, if you have a really snowy climate and it's really cold, you may not want to use your high tunnel in the winter time anyways. And so you could remove the plastic and um, keep it for the next season. So here's some photos of some homemade hand high tunnels. So another thing that you can do, I've kind of, um, alluded to this a little bit, a lot of times season extension is going to be used to, like I said, um, increase the heat around your plant and increase the heat for the microclimate around your plant, but you can also cool down your plant a little bit. So you can do simple things like, you know, um, in the summertime, maybe your lettuces, you're going to plant on a shady side of the building, or you're going to plant, I've, um, maybe like a trellis system and then maybe have your cucumbers growing over or your pole beans and then you can plant lettuces underneath that. So that can help to reduce bolting and keep those cool season crops happy a little bit longer. You can also use things like lattice over a growing area or a laugh house. Um, but of course you need to think about this a little bit in advance and you know try and think about, okay, what is this garden gonna be like in a couple months and what can I do to kind of help um, my, my crops do a little bit better during the summer. Um, the other thing to think about is pollinator access. So if you're to have a shaded greenhouse like you have here and you have a crop like your tomatoes or your cucumbers that need to be, um, they need to be pollinated, your pollinators are not going to be able to get in there. So that's gonna be a problem. So very important with, um, Season extension is thinking about location, not only with your climate, as I mentioned, with the differences between where Nicole lives and where I live, but also the location of um, different things in your garden. So the location of your high tunnels, which orientation do you have? Where are the buildings? You know, is there a windbreak nearby? So these are all different things that you can take into consideration when thinking about um, where to place these structures and what type of structures to use. So when thinking about season extension in the spring, um, some things you can do is if you had like a high tunnel, for example, or even a low tunnel, if it's staying a little bit drier because you have plastic over it or even um, having the fabric over it, the um, row covers over it can help as well just kind of keep the, the rain from pounding a particular area, especially here in the Willamette Valley. And so keeping that in mind that if these areas are protected a little bit more, the soil can be a little bit warmer, the um, soil can be worked a little bit earlier as well. And some, some of the crops that you could plant in some of those situations, you can kind of get a head start on your arugula, radishes, spinach, and that sort of thing. Um, and again, keep in mind with your climate, you know, make sure you know what your temperature conditions are like. And when you're thinking about how much in advance you're gonna plant it. So you might get a few weeks or so that you would try and plant your um, lettuce prior to what you would have ordinarily done if you had some season extension. You can also get an early start on things like peppers and tomatoes, like I showed with those cloches, or you have, you know, cold frame or something and you can put your small starts in there um, and get them get them going with some warmer temperature. And you also wanna make sure that you're using high quality starts. So a lot of times starts are grown indoors to start out with, but if you don't have good lighting for your starts, you wanna make sure that they're not spindly and you're kind of getting your plants off right. And then the last thing that I'll talk about here before I switch off to Nicole is fall season extension. And so this is gonna be used, as I mentioned, to you know, increase your harvest time into the fall season. 
And one thing that you can really do with a lot of cool season crops is use what are called succession plantings. And so that means that you're going to plant lettuce, for example, at two week spacing. So you'll plant one, one crop one week, and then you wait a couple weeks and then plant again. And so using season extension, you can get you know, more crops like that into the fall, and then you can just keep harvesting as you go. Um, you can also um, plant in kind of late summer, early fall. And then um, if you're in a climate like the Willamette Valley or you live in a climate where it doesn't get too cold, you can plant and keep your crops into the ground over the winter and then harvest in late winter or early spring. And then, as I mentioned before, it can be really helpful for the Willamette Valley to have your crops protected from rain, but it's not gonna really be a problem. I mean, a problem solving for everything because you know you could, let's say, cover your tomatoes in the Willamette Valley into the fall, and it will help a little bit to you know, keep those plants dry from the rain because a lot of times the diseases become an issue as you get into the fall and you start to have fall rains. But keep in mind that it is gonna be getting cooler. Um, your light levels are gonna be really getting low. And so it's not you know, gonna help you know, protect your crop forever. Your tomatoes are still gonna to start to go downhill, but you can still get you know, maybe an extra couple of weeks depending upon weather conditions out of those summer crops. So with that, I am ready for a question break. And then we're gonna switch on to Nicole. Great, thank you, Heather. Um, so we do have a couple of questions. Um, a very popular question has been, I'm interested in non-plastic, excuse me, non-plastic materials that can be used instead of plastic um, because it can be unsustainable, made of fossil fuels, et cetera. Are there any that can be used? Yeah, I'm not aware of, I guess, alternatives to plastic. It's definitely a huge issue when it comes to, you know, I think many people want to be sustainable and not use plastic if they don't have to. Like I said, you could use, you know, some of these blankets or these row covers over them. You're not going to get quite as much warmth out of them, but sometimes that can be a good thing because you don't have to, you know, worry about um, cooling the space quite as much and using as many adjustments. A lot of these plastics can be reused though. So you could place them over and use them multiple years. So it kind of depends on the quality of plastic that you buy. So if you um, buy a little bit of thicker plastic, off it can be taken off and reused. So that can be an option. And same with the row covers, they can often be taken off and reused as well. And Nicole- I'd like to like address that at. question as well. There, there are paper mulches that can be purchased. So there certainly are, you know, alternatives out there, but they don't tend to warm the soil in the same way that that black plastic does. Um, there's some, you know, options for creativity and reuse here as well. So um, personally, I have had a friend that owned a pool company for years and years, and he always ended up with these oddly shaped scraps of black plastic that he didn't have another use for. So my ability to use those in the garden made me feel like I was using a piece of plastic that would have otherwise gone to the dump. So um, also, as you pointed out, Heather, they can be reused multiple times. And then um, depending on your situation, if you have a soil where you're having a lot of trouble with the value of evaporation and where water is short, keep it in mind that there's maybe some level of um, less water that you can use with that might weigh into the situation as well, as, long, as well as um, the effort with the weed suppression. So everything's a trade-off with that, but there's other inputs that typically um, would be less if you're able to use that, that for some folks might seem like a worthwhile trade-off. Great, and then, um... Earlier, we had a couple of upvotes on this and Nicole put in a great link to heat stress on plants. Um, but Brenda asked, because of our higher than usual temperatures, I would like to know more about protecting my veggies from extreme heat. So is there any special tip or trick that you have for protecting veggies from high temperatures? 
So even in the years where we don't have such crazy high temperatures like we're having this summer, I'm seeing the commercial growers in our area using shade cloth in situations where um, there's long southern exposure to try to keep fruit from scalding or sunburning. And that's happening, you know, just in our regular summer. So um, a lot of shade cloth can be used. There's a variety of different shades that um, are different um, thicknesses of that that provide different levels of shade. Um, lat lath or latticing can be really helpful. So those can be used and, and maybe somewhat easily moved around as need be to apply that shade when it's necessary. Great. Um... I think then, Nicole, we can transition to your part of the talk to make sure we get through and um, unless you all want to take one more question. So we have about 20 minutes till four. Okay, um, let's, right. let's go ahead and move forward and we'll make sure and have an opportunity to answer questions at the end. Yep, we'll have time to do that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm trying to advance my slide here. <laughs> It's slow to, slow to respond. Okay, here we go. So I do have another poll question that I'm going to start. Okay. So the question here is, what season extension techniques have you used? Select all that applied. So we're looking to kind of get some information now that you've heard a little bit about the um, different kinds of season extension. Um, so we're looking to gain a little bit more about, you know, what have you used in the past? So feel free to start answering that question. And once you've gotten to it, then I'll end the poll and share the results. All right, so it looks like most of you have been able to participate by now. So I'm going to end the poll as a way to um, move on to our next question. And I'm gonna share the results. So it looks like the most commonly used season extension technique has been row covers, which makes sense because it's one of the easiest things to get into. Less common is hotbeds. Um, fair number of people have also used cold frames and low tunnels. Um, let me see here. So I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to get this next one shared, the next one started here. So we might have to skip our second question here. Okay, so we're just gonna move on here. All right, thank you so much, Heather. <clears throat> so let's say that you've decided you're ready to use season extension, um, determined what tools might be most helpful in your own garden situation. There's some things you can consider that are going to help your use of season extension be more successful. So it's really helpful that you have a good understanding of what your growing season looks like typically. Since season extension, the use of season extension often tweaks what that growing season might look like. An understanding of what it looks like without using it can be really helpful for you to be able to understand how ex the extension techniques have actually changed what's going on. You also wanna have a pretty good idea of when your first and last frost dates typically are and the number of growing days that are typical for your particular area. The Farmer's Almanac, which you can access online, has a pretty uh, handy tool where you can put in your zip code and it will give you um, some information about that. So remember that regardless of which tool that you use, 
these aren't magic bullets that just create any climate that you want. This is not a climate controlled situation. You're just trying to tweak what's already there. So if you have a good understanding of what temperatures are likely to be, then you're gonna better understand what you might be able to manipulate. And deciding what crops to plant ties into that. If you are still early in your season, even with something like a low tunnel or a cold frame, you still don't wanna plant your warm, hot loving crops like tomatoes and cucumbers early in the season. Um, and you also wanna think about for your given growing situation and your climate, which things actually make sense to use season extension for. Sometimes it's not necessary. So you might think about using those tools as kind of your high dollar real estate. What makes the most sense to use there? As Heather's pointed out, none of these tools are things that you can just put on the plants and then walk away from. So you wanna make sure that you're investing that extra time and effort into the things where it's going to make the most sense for you. Um, so this is gonna come from a combination of which plants and foods are most important to you, your region, your particular growing space, your budget, what things are easy for you to use, what you're actually gonna be able to open shut or move or manipulate. So there's a variety of things that you wanna take into consideration. And then you wanna remember that the goal here is to have either some earlier harvests in the spring or some later harvests in the fall. So there's typically just a little bit of math included here to map out your planting dates, given that you're shooting for those early or later um, harvests. And we may or may not expect that something grown in say a cold frame or by using row covers is going to mature at exactly the same rate that it would without. So there's a little bit of experimentation involved here, but mapping out your planting dates can also be really helpful in determining which of these tools are gonna make sense. Another thing to really give some thought about, particularly for any of your fruiting vegetables, is making sure that you're choosing varieties that make sense for the situation. So it's not quite as important with things like spinach or um, maybe arugula and some of your herbs in terms of the varieties that you use relative to having them under cover. But with your things like tomatoes and cucumbers and squash, it can make a huge difference. So let's say you're using low tunnels or high tunnels. If you've got those plants cordoned off where pollinators can't get to them, then either you are not going to get very much fruit or more likely and hopefully you've chosen some varieties that can produce fruit without pollinators. So for instance, with cucumbers, there are some now where having pollinators is not as important. Those do really well, for instance, in greenhouses or low tunnels. So that might be something to consider. With tomatoes, um, which are typically wind pollinated and can also be um, pollinated through vibration. There's a big difference in terms of how some of our tomatoes uh, perform in the greenhouse. So just as an example, some particularly of the larger varieties of tomatoes and some of the heirloom tomatoes have challenges with the bloom falling off of the bottom of the fruit in a greenhouse situation, which we would, um, also think about for high tunnels or low tunnels. And that bloom not falling off of the fruit causes a little bit of misshaping on the fruit. So by choosing a variety that would be appropriate for say a greenhouse, you're gonna eliminate some of that. Um, there's not so much, there's not so many varieties currently listed, uh, for example, for use with season extension or for use in high tunnels but by choosing things that might be appropriate for greenhouse use, particularly with those fruiting things, um, that might be very helpful there. And then because we're trying to work with these um, big extremes in temperature sometimes, remember our covered items are gonna heat up. You might think about slow bolting varieties. And then remember for things like broccoli and cabbage that there are actually varieties that perform better depending on the season. 
You can actually choose broccolis that work better, for instance, in the spring. All right, so again, remember that your days to maturity might not be exactly the same when you're using season extension techniques and to think of that space as um, high dollar real estate. Next slide, please, Heather. Sorry, it's not really moving forward here. <laughs> it's been kind of slow to respond here. So as it's getting ready to respond, we're gonna take a look at some data that's come from uh, some looking at seedlings and soil temperature, and then some also some applications of season extension and some commercial situations, which um, we're hopeful that you can think about in terms of your home garden and will be helpful. So when we're starting off our seedlings, it's sometimes easy to forget how important soil temperature is. So what you're looking at here is a list of the different crops, broccoli, peas, and onions, and then some warmer crops at the bottom there. Across the top there is different soil temperatures. And then the numbers correspond to how many days it took those seeds to germinate under that given temperature. So you can see, for instance, that with broccoli, at 41 degrees soil temperature, it takes 28 days for that broccoli seed to germinate. But at 86 degrees, broccoli only took four days to germinate. So broccoli actually germinates better at a higher temperature than it grows at. The same is true for peas and for onions. On the other hand, with our fruiting vegetables, they don't germinate well at low temperatures they tend to grow and germinate better at those higher temperatures. So keep in mind that it's often the soil temperature that you're concerned about early in that process with your germination. And the germination temperature doesn't always correspond to the ideal growing temperature for that particular plant. All right, next up. So generally it's considered in many parts of the country that when you're using a season extension technique like a high tunnel, that you're effectively moving that growing zone, one growing zone to the south or one growing zone warmer. So say for instance, you're using a high tunnel, you're theoretically moving to a one warmer growing zone. I'm not convinced that's true for most of the climate here in Eastern Oregon. There isn't data to say specifically that so, but the idea is that by combining multiple tactics, you can push that even a little bit further. So you're, used, you're seeing a picture here of all along one side wall of a high tunnel and three different sections of it. In the top picture, you have six milliliter thick plastic that's being used as a low tunnel inside the high tunnel. Compare the difference there to the plants in the middle that have a tie par cover on that low tunnel. So that's a much thinner, lighter material. And then at the bottom, just the high tunnel without an additional cover. So the idea here is to illustrate that multiple tactics um, actually can produce some different effects. Go ahead and uh, start switching to the next slide, Heather. I will just share that in my own high tunnel, I've experimented with this as a way to look at whether I can um, really impact how my leafy greens are coming to maturity. So for instance, I've tried to experiment with things like if I plant all the seeds at the same time, but I cover them differently, does it actually change the maturity here? So here's another example with the bok choy. All of this bok choy was planted at the same time in the same tunnel. The largest bok choy there on the left-hand side uh, had an additional inner cover, and then it did, a, did fairly well with that tie par inner cover, and then the plants are much smaller with no cover at all. So depending on what my schedule and preference was as a gardener, I could either stagger out my plantings and do them at different times, or maybe I could plant them all at the same time and protect them differently to stagger out when I was actually harvesting things. All right, next up, please.
So our use of season extension is always going to vary from one region to the, to the next. Here in the Pacific Northwest, we often have trouble with light issues in the off season. So keep in mind that this um, particular data comes from the Eastern and Southern part of the US where uh, the numbers might look a little bit different. But what you're seeing here again is that there's a significant difference in how long it takes for this material to be harvestable, depending on which season extension technique you are using. So in this case, we had a high tunnel that was kept warmer, a high tunnel that was kept cooler, and the difference in production or when that material was harvestable was not that difference between not that different between the warm and the cool high tunnels. But when we played with those additional covers as a second tactic, that's actually where the biggest differences in production time or, or when the material was available to harvest came in. All right, next, please. All right, so remember our cultivars do matter. We alluded to that. So let's look at the cumulative total year yield for tomatoes. So we looked at two varieties here. The green line corresponds to the tomatoes grown in the tunnel, the red line to the field. So the point that we're trying to make here is that tomato harvest started about two and a half weeks earlier in the tunnel tomatoes and that the overall uh, yield on tomatoes in the tunnel was higher than field tomatoes. This is um, probably most most applicable in uh, some of our wetter areas where, as Heather mentioned, there can be a lot of uh, diseases with tomato that are associated with moisture on the leaves. And so some of this um, higher yield was attributed to the fact that there was a lot less disease pressure in the high tunnel where the leaves were not wet and they were actually irrigated at the bottom. But then also take a look at this um, bar graph there on the lower and left-hand side of the slide. And you can see that there's a huge difference between cultivars too. So with or that's your variety, your cultivated variety of tomatoes. So make sure to look for those ones that are appropriate for greenhouses. All right, next up, please. All right, so we've got greenhouse appropriate varieties. We can use um, with some of our brassica crops, ones that are specific to the spring or the fall. Um, we've got some cultivars that can kind of shoulder either of those, but sometimes it's just a matter of experimentation. So in the picture here, you've got some lettuce. All of those lettuces are listed as being appropriate for greenhouse production, but you can see there's a big difference in how they're responding in this particular situation. We are starting to see some cultivars be encoded in the catalogs for season extension. So that's something you can continue to look out for. It might be helpful, particular in the Eastern side of Oregon, where we have a really short growing season to select varieties that mature quickly or have a shorter days to maturity. And also uh, some of you alluded to this in one of your question about things you might start in a cloche or a hotbed. Keep in mind that you can choose varieties that naturally stay more compact. Those are going to be a lot easier to cover with a row cover or to put the lid of a um, cold frame over or that type of thing. So remember that um, with some of these compact varieties, if you can maintain them, you can extend your period of actual production. And again, I would encourage you to just think about which plants make the most sense for you. Um, and which are gonna provide the most return on your investment of time and money. All right, next up. All right, so just thinking about some of these different um, options out here. Tomatoes are very popular because um, we, they're the most popular vegetable we grow, that we can also potentially save a lot of money from buying those in the store. Some of you might question that and especially if you've seen the $64 tomato about all these things. Um, but, you know, for me, we eat lots and lots of leaf lettuce at our house and that can get pretty pricey, but that's pretty easy to grow. So I find that that works really well for our house. I worry less about some of those root crops in season extension. That would be something that I'd probably be more likely to put outside, maybe put a row cover on it if necessary. 
keep in mind that um, your warm season fruits might benefit most from that early start. So again, it's, it's looking at the combination of your personal preference and the resources that are available to you. All right, next up, please. All right, so we're right on four o'clock, but I think we're good for stopping to um, answer more questions now. And uh, thank you, Andrea, for posting a bunch of resources in the chat there. I understand that those will also be available in an email that you'll get to follow up. So if you wanna read more about some of these topics, we've put together a variety of resources for you. What questions do we have? So we don't actually have any more questions in the Q&A. Um, right now, it looks like we were able to answer them all. So if anyone has remaining questions, oh, here's one that, oh, uh, thank you, popped in. Um, so if anyone has any questions remaining, you can go ahead and um, type those into the chat. Um, so I'll go ahead and give our closing statement. Thank you for coming today. And if you're a Master Gardener volunteer, you can receive continuing education credit for today's session. Um, track and submit your time through the guidance of your local county coordinator. And for everyone, our next webinar in the series will be Gardening with Native Plants for Pollinators on September 14th with Dr. Gail Langelato. And the whole schedule for Growing Oregon Gardeners Level Up series is on our website, and we hope to see you at a future session. Happy gardening.